Hi everyone. So the goal of this video is to learn how to handle multiple grouping variables in the context of fitting a model by least squares. Uh, and so to do that, let's just review the very simple case that we saw at the beginning of this chapter. Simple groupwise model with a single binary predictor, uh, and so that our category labels xi for the ith case are either 0 or 1. And that model takes this form, uh, where the response for the ith case is the baseline uh, plus the offset times the dummy variable. And so when xi equals 1, this dummy variable is active and we have the offset added in. When xi equals 0, this dummy variable is 0 and this whole thing drops out. We're left with just the baseline. Okay, And so that's a, a nice feature of the dummy variable approach. Uh, if what you're interested in in a statistical model is the differences between conditions, uh, then this beta 1 coefficient gets you exactly the numerical magnitude of that difference. Okay, so now let's see how we can uh, use this uh, strategy of encoding grouping information using dummy variables to take into account multiple uh, grouping variables at once. Okay, so uh, the data set that we're going to look at is the one shown in this picture right here. So uh, a little bit of background right here. You're looking at data uh, from an experiment run by a video game manufacturer. Uh, and so what's the goal? So, you know, if you want to build a good video game, obviously you got to have some good artists, you got to have some good computer programmers, you got to have a good story or a concept, uh, but you also have to have a really good handle on human visual perception, and in particular the idea of reaction time. Uh, so I'll use the example of like my favorite video game from when I was a child, which was Mario Kart on the old school Super Nintendo. Uh, and, you know, for those of you that never saw Mario Kart or haven't, uh, you know, haven't played it, I'm sure you can go find some YouTube videos, but the basic idea, you pick your Mario character, you know, Mario or Yoshi or Princess or whatever, uh, and you would get in a car and you would race around a track three or four laps, uh, and then uh, your opponents, uh, you know, who hopefully would like your you know, little brother or your friends or something, uh, they were also racing on a different controller, uh, and they could shoot these little Koopa shells at you uh, to sort of knock you off course, right? So, you know, you would be ahead, but then somebody that was behind you uh, would have this, this shell that they would shoot out of their car, uh, and if they hit you, uh, you were knocked out of the race for like five seconds. And, you know, there would be like some stars around your head and the video game would put you th through some kind of concussion protocol before you could actually get back in the race. And so by that point, you were behind. Uh, and so the idea was that the Koopa shells were kind of an equalizer in the game and, and you had to have uh, the right reaction time if you were to dodge these things. So think about that, like from the standpoint of reaction time, if you're the video game designer. Uh, you uh, want to make sure that the required reaction time uh, is fast enough to be interesting, right? If, if uh, you know, you, you only have to react like, you know, oh, in the order of five seconds or something, and then you can be grandma over there driving and you can dodge this Koopa shell. Uh, but uh, if the reaction uh, time required is too fast, then it's impossible to dodge and it becomes uh, unfun, right? The game is just too hard. So, you know, there's kind of like a fine balance between the, the right amount of reaction time required that they, the programmers have to build into the video game. Uh, and so, you know, this kind of idea of reaction time being a really important determining factor in how fun the video game is, uh, is a common factor to a lot of video games, like the shooting ones, the racing ones, whatever. Reaction time is important. Uh, and so the video game manufacturers spend a lot of time studying reaction time. It's kind of a, a, a fun fact about video games. So uh, here's, a, here's an experiment in which the video game manufacturers were studying reaction time. The basic idea, uh, they were trying to understand how rapidly people could respond to some kind of new information in the visual environment, you know, maybe like a bad guy popping up to shoot you in the video game. Uh, so here's what they did. They had 12 different subjects, and those subjects are labeled here on this x-axis, uh, and they vary the experimental conditions for this visual identification task. So they would show a visual scene to each subject, and they did it repeatedly for multiple trials, uh, and in the visual scene, uh, there would be a number that would pop up, like a number one or a number two at some random part in the visual scene. Uh, and the subjects would have a little button in front of them, like two buttons, and they would have to press one or two, depending on which number popped up. And the idea was when the number popped up, you would, as quickly as can, press the right number. If a one popped up, press one, and, and if two popped up, you would press two. Uh, and the video game people who were running the experiment were measuring the reaction time of the subjects. Uh, and they were doing it in such a way that they, they varied the, the conditions of the visual scene. So, you know, on your monitor, sometimes the scene that you would uh, be shown, the, the number that would pop up would be uh, close to you, like in the visual foreground, and sometimes it would be far away from you uh, in the visual background. And you could imagine that it'd be harder to, to sort of react quickly to things that, are, that appear to be far away from you in the visual scene. They're smaller, they look far away. Uh, and so it seems to be. Here's the far away scenes and here's the close scenes. And it looks like the reaction time is measured in milliseconds 
is a little bit higher on average across all subjects for the, the faraway scenes. Similarly, uh, some of the scenes were cluttered. You know, it wasn't just like a nice, pretty landscape. There were trees in the way or, you know, maybe like a lion running across the scene or something or a bad guy popping up. Uh, and so there was sort of other things that could distract you in the visual scene and you had to ignore all that stuff to identify when the number popped up and react quickly to identify what that number was. So it turns out and when the scenes were cluttered, uh, the average reaction time was, I don't know, just eyeballing that, about 100 milliseconds slower uh, than the average reaction time when the scenes were uncluttered. Uh, and finally, what you're seeing down here is some differences among the subjects. Uh, so, you know, there's no logic to the, the numbering here. It skips some numbers, 6, 8, 9, 10, 12, etc. Uh, but, you know, here's 12 different subjects, and you notice that some people are, are just better at video games. Here's like the world champion video game player. He's on average or she is on average faster than everybody else. Uh, you know, and here's like me, the person who, you know, got left behind uh, with the Super Nintendo. Uh, and never learned how to, you know, play any of the cooler, slicker video games. So my reaction time is super slow. That's me right there. Not really, but uh, that would be like me. So there's clearly some differences among the individual subjects in the trial in terms of how fast uh, their reaction time is. And the idea uh, of this uh, experiment is we want to model the effect of all of those different variables at once on the response. So let's talk about how we can use dummy variables to do that. Let's go through. All right. Uh, and I'm going to skip over here this idea of the slice and dice strategy. You can read about that in the course packet. Let's just jump straight to the dummy variable idea. Uh, so let's let's talk about two variables only here. Let's ignore those subject effects for now and pretend we're talking about the model within a, sub a single subject. Here's the idea. Uh, let's say that you've got the two variables, and we'll denote those by xi1. Uh, the For the ith observation, that's the value of the, uh, I believe that we're calling that the the clutter variable right there. So uh, that's, uh, if clutter is, is on, then, then we have a, a one effect if, if you have a cluttered scene. Uh, and xi2, we're gonna say that's an indicator or dummy variable uh, of whether uh, the scene is far away. So there's your clutter effect and there's your far away effect. And you can see, you know, if you wanna uh, model the effect of both, you just sum the individual effects, okay? So i is telling you which case you were on and one versus two is telling you which variable you're talking about, uh, the clutter variable and the far away variable. All right, so this uh, this kind of notation up here gets a little bit cumbersome, kind of writing these out as English sentences. It's a little bit more concise to write it in this kind of equation right here. Here's your dummy variable telling you yes or no, is the scene cluttered? Here's another dummy variable telling you yes or no, is the scene far away? Uh, and here's your clutter effect, and here's your far away effect right here, the coefficients on those dummy variables, beta 1 uh, and beta 2. Okay, and so those uh, the dummy variables are just telling you present or absent. Does this coefficient come in, beta 1, uh, or not? And does this coefficient, beta 2, come in or not? Now, we would call beta 1 and beta 2 the main effects of the model uh, for reasons that uh, we'll talk about here in a second. Let's just say what those numbers would be if we fitted them by least squares to the data. You get an, a baseline of 482, a uh, cluttered offset of about 87 milliseconds, and a far away offset of about 50 seconds. Okay, so this is saying that if the scene is cluttered, on average, the reaction time goes up by 87 milliseconds. If the scene is far away, on average, it goes up by 50. And the reason we call these main effects, uh, it, it's by contrast with something that we're about to talk about called interactions. Uh, and here's, here's the basic uh, thing about a main effect. A main effect has a, a, an effect on the y variable that is constant across all other conditions. In other words, if the scene is littered or cluttered here, we add 87 milliseconds on average to a typical person's reaction time. And it doesn't matter whether the scene is far away or not. That's that 87 is 87, regardless of what this other variable is doing over here. Similarly, this main effect for the far away scenes, if the scene is far away, that adds on average 50 milliseconds in our fitted model right here. And it's 50 milliseconds regardless of whether the scene is cluttered or not. That doesn't matter. So these variables, uh, their main effects because they affect the response variable across a broad range of circumstances regardless of what the other variables in the regression model are doing. And the contrast there is interactions. You can imagine that in fact what we've just described there isn't actually a true description of reality. You might think, all right, you know, I've got a scene that's cluttered and that makes me a little bit slower. Uh, I've got another scene that's just far away and that makes me a little bit slower. 
Uh, but if I've got a scene that's both cluttered and far away, you might imagine that there's some way in which the whole uh, is greater than the sum of the parts. In other words, it's sort of extra hard because both difficult situations are there. And so this, this might be true. You know, you might have like a, an X1 effect, a clutter effect, an X2 effect, and then some kind of joint effect, some synergy effect. And that's exactly uh, what we would call these. They're synergies. And, you know, that comes from this ancient Greek word here, synergia, uh, which means roughly uh, like working together. Uh, of course, that's the origin of our English word synergy. Uh, and you can think of synergies all the time, things where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You know, you can't have a, a film just an actor or just a cameraman. You put them together and they have synergy, they can make a film. Uh, you can't make water with just hydrogen or just oxygen, but you put hydrogen and oxygen together and you get something that's very different than the sum of the parts. Uh, you know, my favorite Tour de France analogy here, you know, if you take it in a bike and you bike up a really, really steep hill uh, up in the Alps in France, that's pretty hard. Uh, if you bike on flat ground in a really, really high gear, uh, that's pretty hard too. But if you try to bike up the Alps in a really big gear, uh, that's basically impossible unless you're taking EPO, unless you're on drugs and getting busted uh, for the Tour de France. So, you know, those are examples of synergies where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, and that could be true here. It could be the case that for the video game data, if you get both a cluttered and a faraway scene, there's some kind of extra sauce in there, some extra effect if they're both there. And the way we would operationalize, uh, operationalize that idea in a statistical model is using what's called an interaction term. And the way we do that is by multiplying dummy variables together. Uh, so remember, these dummy variables are either on or off, 0 or 1, depending on the value of the corresponding x variable, x1 being clutter and x2 being far away here. Uh, so uh, let, let's look at what happens here, right? If, uh, if the x1 variable is on, then this term comes in. If the x2 variable is on, then this term comes in. And if they're both on, then this term comes in, this term comes in, and this term comes in, because we get a 1 times a 1, and that's a 1. And if only one or the other is in, then this term zeroes out right here, because one of these two variables is going to be 0, and that's going to zero out this whole term. So we call this beta 1, 2 an interaction term, and it disappears unless both x1 and x2 uh, are equal to one, cluttered and far away. Uh, and here are the estimates for the video game data if we fit the interaction model by least squares here at the top. Uh, so the baseline reaction time is 491 milliseconds. The main effect for clutter is 68 milliseconds. The main effect for far away is 31. And the interaction term is 39 milliseconds. So scenes that are both cluttered and far away uh, give you average reaction times for a typical participant in the study that are 39 milliseconds slower than you would predict based on the sum of the individual main effects, okay? Uh, and a key point that you have to realize about interactions is that if you're thinking about when both variables are on, cluttered and far away, down here this fourth bullet point, both the main effects and the interaction terms enter the model. So you get 491, the baseline, plus both of the two main effects for the individual variables, plus the interaction term of 39, and that gives you 629 right here. And once you've done this for two variables, right, in this case cluttered and far away being two separate categorical variables, uh, you can do it in combination with as many categorical variables as you want. So for example, let's say that we now wanted to incorporate that subject effect that we noticed, the fact that some people are really good at video games and have faster reaction time, and some people are slower like me and I have a slower average reaction time. Uh, and so in this kind of thing, you know, let's say we wanted a clutter effect, a main effect for distance, an interaction between distance and clutter, and then we could also have subject-level dummy variables to get at those subject-level differences. So sure enough, if you fit this model by least squares, here's your main effect for clutter, 68 milliseconds slower, your main effect for far away, 31. Here are your 11 dummy variables corresponding to uh, the 11 other subjects who aren't the baseline. So here this baseline corresponds to subject 6. You get 11 subject level dummy variables. I remember our general rule is if you have big K categories for a, uh, a categorical variable, you'll need K minus 1 dummy variables. So here we've got 12 subjects and 11 dummy variable coefficients right here. And then finally, there's our cluttered and far away interaction. Here's the big table of coefficients over here. Uh, and depending on which subject you are and which experimental conditions you are, you can just pick out what the expected value of the y variable is from this table of coefficients right here. Now, 
a really important question here is, when should you include interactions in a model? Uh, that's a tough question, and we will learn some formal statistical criteria for judging that a lot later. But let's talk about the essence of the choice right now. Uh, and, and this is, you know, for now, kind of intuition and knowledge of the data set and just educated guessing will get you pretty far. Uh, and, and here's the essence of the choice. Uh, you have to decide whether some variable, like the clutter effect in a video game, for example, you have to decide if that variable affects the response in a broadly similar way across all conditions, no matter what the other variables are doing, or whether that's not true. So if that's true, then that variable warrants only a main effect. On the other hand, if that variable's effect is modulated by some other variable, uh, in other words, the fact that the scene is far away changes how much that clutter effect has on the response. That's a modulating effect right there. Then we should describe that using an interaction between two variables. And here in the beginning, uh, it's better to just think in terms of substantive knowledge of the problem and of the data set to decide which of those two choices you think is plausible. Again, we will learn things like the analysis of variance and hypothesis testing that will help us judge whether an interaction term should be in the model using formal statistical criteria, but not yet. We'll walk before we can run. Uh, and, and I'll just give kind of a, an example to, to close things off here um, about an interaction term that it's sort of how you would think about uh, in a particular uh, setting making this choice. Uh, so, uh, you know, I used to row uh, when I was a lot younger and, and uh, what tier two variables that affect how fast uh, a rowboat, you know, you got eight big people in the boat, uh, and uh, how fast can the boat go? So uh, here are two variables that affect things. So first of all, the weight of the crew has a huge determining factor on the speed of the boat, and heavier crews go a lot faster. Uh, you can imagine, you know, to row is like, you know, holding onto an oar and putting all of your body weight into that oar in order to send the water the opposite direction. So the, the heavier you are, the more weight you can haul on with that oar, uh, and the faster you're going to make the boat go. So on average, bigger crews are going to go a lot faster, and that's why all the people you see rowing in the Olympics, uh, you know, like in the men's rowing team, for example, they're all like 6'6", 230 pounds, they're big guys. Uh, and the women's rowing team, they're also very, very big people as well, big, strong, uh, fast rowers. So, so crew weight has a big effect on boat speed. Here's another variable that has an effect on boat speed. It's wind. So it's a lot harder to row fast in the wind. Okay? However, wind affects a heavier crew much less than it affects a lighter crew. So there's a perfect example of a modulating effect of one variable on another. We would say that the weight of a crew, variable 1, modulates the effect of variable 2, wind speed. So if you're heavier, wind speed is going to affect you a lot less than if you're lighter. So that's a perfect example of where, if you kind of knew something about the problem, you might think about putting an interaction term between those two variables, and because main effects only aren't going to get it done. All right, so that closes off the, uh, the introduction to interaction terms right there. Uh, and, and I'll give you one final generic guideline about interactions. Uh, we basically never include interaction terms in a model without also including both corresponding main effects. And there's a bunch of technical reasons uh, why, uh, why you would do that, and we're not going to go into the technical reasons. Uh, basically, the important thing here is that it makes the model extremely difficult to interpret if you do this. So, a generic guideline, unless you really, really know what you're doing, uh, you should only ever include an interaction in a model, even contemplate including it in a model, if you've got both main effects in there already.